Hey there everybody, this is the first video in a three-part series on category theory. The goal of this series is to introduce you to some basic concepts from category theory, including categories, functors, and universal properties, and to show you some interesting applications to functional programming. So let's get started with categories. First I want to provide just a little bit of historical context. Category theory was originally invented in the 1940s by two mathematicians, Samuel Eilenberg and Saunders MacLean. It was initially applied in algebraic topology and then in algebraic geometry. However, it later found many other applications, for example in logic, computer science, linguistics, philosophy, and other areas. Part of the reason category theory has been so successful is that it's a sort of universal mathematical language, which tends to reveal interesting connections between seemingly unrelated subjects, like logic and geometry. It is highly abstract. In fact, it's sometimes jokingly referred to as abstract nonsense. However, it yields deep, elegant, and powerful results. So what is a category? We will define it over the next few slides. A category consists of two types of things. Objects, which we typically denote by letters like A, B, C, and so on. And arrows, which we typically denote by letters like F, G, H, and so on. Each arrow has a domain, or source object, and a codomain, or target object. We write F, A, arrow, B, to indicate that F is an arrow with domain A and codomain B. Importantly, in this definition, we don't say what the objects and arrows are. We only specify the properties they must satisfy to constitute a category. This is what makes the definition abstract. First, if F is an arrow from A to B, and G is an arrow from B to C, then there is a composite arrow G after F from A to C, which makes the following diagram commute. In this diagram, you can see that we have the arrow F from A to B, and the arrow G from B to C, as well as the composite arrow G after F from A to C. The composite represents the result of first applying F and then applying G. The diagram is said to commute because, starting at A, you can either go across to B along F and then down to C along G, or you can go diagonally from A to C along the composite and get the same result. Commutative diagrams like this are used frequently in category theory because they provide a way to visualize what's happening in a category. In addition to composite arrows, Every object A has an identity arrow, typically denoted 1A, from A to A. We don't usually draw the identity arrows in diagrams. The law of composition for arrows needs to satisfy two properties. The first is associativity. It says that if you want to compose three arrows, F from A to B, G from B to C, and H from C to D, then it doesn't matter which pair you compose first. You can first compose F and G, and then compose the result with H, or you can first compose G and H, and then compose the result with F. You get the same result either way. This allows us to avoid writing parentheses when composing three or more arrows. The second property is unity. It says that the identity arrows don't do anything. If F is an arrow from A to B, then applying F after applying the identity on A is just the same as applying F. Similarly for applying the identity on B after applying F. Although the identity arrows don't do anything, they're still useful, just like the number 0 is useful as the identity for addition, and the number 1 is useful as the identity for multiplication. These properties seem somewhat technical when written out, but they're actually very natural, and they're satisfied in many situations. In summary then, a category is a collection of objects, and arrows between those objects, with a law of composition for arrows that is associative and unital. It turns out that categories are everywhere. We now look at some examples. In the category of sets, the objects are sets, and the arrows are functions between sets. For example, the set n of natural numbers, consisting of 0, 1, 2, and so on, is an object in this category. The function f of x equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1 is an arrow, say from the real numbers to the real numbers. As another example, in the category vect, the objects are vector spaces, over the real numbers, say and the arrows are linear mappings. If we restrict attention to just the finite dimensional spaces, we get the subcategory vectfin. In this category, vectors and mappings can be represented by matrices. There are many other similar categories of structured sets, where the arrows are functions which preserve the structure. 
However, importantly, the objects in a category need not have elements, and the arrows need not be functions. To see this, consider a category from logic, where the objects are propositions, and the arrows are logical implications between those propositions. For example, the proposition I am a teapot is an object in this category, and the implication I am a teapot implies I am a teapot is an arrow in this category. Instead of implications, we could take the arrows to be formal proofs in some deduction system. In this case, there may be more than one arrow between two propositions. For additional examples, we consider the lambda calculus, which we revisit throughout this video series. The lambda calculus provides a formalization of the notion of a computable function. By a computable function, I mean a function that can be, well, computed, like on a modern computer. The lambda calculus inspired modern functional programming languages like Lisp, Erlang, Haskell, and many others. It even inspired non-functional programming languages where anonymous functions are often called lambdas. To provide just a bit of historical context here, the lambda calculus was introduced in the 1930s by Alonzo Church in his study of the foundations of mathematics and computation. It's important to note that the modern stored program computer didn't exist at this time, so this was a theoretical notion of computation. It's actually just one of many equivalent ways of defining computable functions. Some other approaches are seen here. Amazingly, all of these different approaches yield the same class of computable functions. This lends support to the claim that any function that we intuitively think is computable is actually definable in the lambda calculus. This claim is known as Church's thesis. As an example, to give you a sense of what the lambda calculus looks like, the function x squared plus 2x plus 1 from earlier might be defined by a lambda expression like this. Here the lambda indicates that it's a function. x is the input variable. Everything to the right represents the output of the function. Of course, I'm completely glossing over how to define numerals like 1 and 2, and how to define arithmetical operations like addition, but it is possible to do in the lambda calculus. Defining a function like this is called abstraction. A computation, like f of 3 equals 16, is then represented like this. Here we are applying the lambda expression to the input 3. This reduces to 3 squared plus 2 times 3 plus 1, which is just the result of substituting 3 for x in the body of the lambda expression. This in turn reduces to 9 plus 6 plus 1, which in turn reduces to 16, which can't be reduced any further. Church's key insight was that any computation, no matter how complex, can ultimately be represented as a sequence of syntactic substitutions like this. In the typed lambda calculus, values have types. We're going to assume the existence of some basic types in what follows. For example, the integer 3 has type int, written 3 colon int. As another example, a function returning the length of a string of characters has type str arrow int, where str is, by definition, the type list of car. It's important to see that the arrow here acts as a type constructor. Given two types, in this case str and int, it returns a new type, in this case the type of functions from str to int. That is, the type of functions that take a string as input and return an integer as output. Similarly, the list bracket is a type constructor. Given a single type, in this case car, it returns a new type, in this case the type list of car. That is, the type of lists of characters. We will need this perspective later on. Now we make a connection to category theory. The types in the lambda calculus form a category under the subtype relation, where an arrow from a type A to a type B means that A is a subtype of B, written A less than B, or B greater than A. Another way to say this is that there's an arrow from the type A to the type B in this category if and only if A is a subtype of B. As an example, int is a subtype of num, the type of all numbers, so int is less than num in this category. Now, as a warning, the notation a arrow b is used to indicate the type of functions from a to b, as we saw on the previous slide, not to indicate that a is a subtype of b. So a arrow b is an object in this category, not an arrow, despite the arrow notation. We always use the less than notation for arrows in this category. We can form a different category of types by taking the arrows from A to B to be the functions from A to B in the lambda calculus. In this case, if f is a function from A to B, and g is a function from B to C, 
then g after f is the function given by this lambda expression. This expression takes x as input, applies f to it, then applies g to the result, and then returns that. It only takes inputs x of type a. The identity function on a is given by this lambda expression. It takes x of type a as input and just returns x. Both of these categories are used in computer science, as we will see. But first, we need to introduce the concept of duality, which is important in category theory and beyond. We start with a non-mathematical example. You may be familiar with the idea of mind-body dualism, which was popularized by René Descartes in the 1600s. It's the idea that our mind, understood as a non-physical entity which is the seat of our consciousness, is distinct from our body, including our brain, but that the two go together and complement each other. This phenomenon of two things going together and complementing each other occurs frequently in mathematics and can be described using category theory. Before getting to that, though, I'll digress for a moment and comment on this drawing from Descartes' Meditations. One of the things that Descartes struggled to explain is how a non-physical mind causally influences a physical body, and vice versa. He postulated that the pineal gland in the brain was the connection point between the mind and the body, almost like a metaphysical USB port. This drawing is supposed to depict that, although I'm not really sure why this person's eyeballs are hanging several inches out of their skull. For a category C, the dual or opposite category C op is obtained by formally reversing the arrows in C. This means that an arrow F from A to B in C becomes the arrow F star to A star from B star in C op. Here we use the star notation to remind ourselves that we're in the dual category, but it's important to remember that these are the same objects and arrows. The arrows have just been formally turned around. In particular, we're not talking about inverse arrows. Composites and identities are defined in a way that makes this work, but it's easier to see what's happening by looking at a diagram. On the left, we have a familiar commutative triangle in C. F goes from A to B, G goes from B to C, and the composite G after F goes from A to C, making the triangle commute. On the right, we have the same commutative triangle in C op. Here, F star goes to A star from B star, G star goes to B star from C star, and g after f star is the composite f star after g star, going to a star from c star and making the triangle commute. As you can see, the arrows in c have just been formally turned around. At first glance, this seems a little silly, but it turns out to be extremely powerful. The reason is that for any category theoretic concept studied in c, we get a dual concept in c op, for which we essentially get theorems for free. These dual concepts turn out to be just as important as the original concepts. By reversing the arrows in C, we're able to double the bang for our buck, so to speak, and significantly expand the scope of our theory. We'll see duality in action later in this video series. That concludes the first video on categories. Stay tuned for the next video, which covers functors.